Welcome to Rogue Blogs. This is episode 55 of the Basketball Series. Welcome. Thanks for joining us again, all our avid listeners and followers. What's going on, bro? Oh, it's just another day in the sun, my man. Just uh, just trying to get through it. No sun where I'm at. I'm in, I'm in Queensland at the moment, pro, and there is massive, massive, massive storms the last probably 48 hours. I've had to... The, the pool here where I'm at right now has been drained twice, about a foot each time. So that tells you how much water has just um, has fallen. It's, it's you know, there's flooding everywhere. Rivers have overflowed. Um, catchments, dams are, you know, overflowing. Roads are closed everywhere. It's uh, it's looking like if there's a world war, we've got, we've got a start of it here, bro. Now you know what my career feels like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it's... Hopefully everyone, you know, in Queensland listening to the podcast stay, can stay safe throughout this. I, w- I went for a drive uh, yesterday and there's, there's road, road closures and people stuck on one side of a river for obviously till it, till it dries up. But looking, looking out my window right now, it, uh, <laughs> it's not looking like it's going to dry up. It's, it's grey as far as the eye can see. But what I love about this place is, Pro, there's, there's still people on the beach. <laughs> no, sh- no kidding. Not not sunbaking, but there's people I can see them right now. There's people walking up and down the beach. There's I'm looking at my window like are these people on the beach? They don't, they don't give a shit here. It's like because it's, it's still you know what is it Fahrenheit 75 80 degrees outside. So 23 24 people don't care. They're like ah no. Nah. Especially if you came up here for a holiday, no, I'm going to the beach. I don't care if it rains. So anyway, everyone listening is here for basketball. So we don't have a, a team of the week this week for obvious reasons because um, the All-Star Weekend would have been pretty pointless because there's only been one, one odd series of games. So what I decided to do, Pro, I hope you did your homework. I wanted to name um, our top 10 playoff playing teams from the East and the West. So, um, And then I wanted to name who your number one seed will be from each conference. So just, just a little bit of uh, trivia for both of us. Now, before we start, when we go to the top 10, I guess – there's probably only one or two teams that'll scrape in from from each conference at the bottom. Maybe um, I'll give you the strength of schedules. So the top five toughest schedules remaining in the NBA as as of today, moving to the end of the season. Top five toughest, hardest schedule: Milwaukee number one, Chicago number two, the Lakers number three, New York number four, Golden State number five. The easiest, so the most easiest schedule. So going from the easiest to the least easiest. Um, Portland's got the easiest schedule. Indiana's next. Memphis, Washington, and Atlanta. So that might help you with your homework, um, but that makes it a little bit of a difference. I don't know if you look too much into into the you know future games and standings and all that, but um, it does make a little bit of a difference. But for the East, me pro, I, I have it as is. I have it currently as is. Um, Atlanta's in the ten at the moment. Washington and, and Atlanta pretty much have the same strength of schedule. Right, like pretty 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 borderline the same. So that's why, I mean, that might have been a factor if I was looking to say maybe, okay, maybe Washington will jump Atlanta. I think Atlanta's gotten gotten healthier. They started to play a little bit better. They're still held to skelter for the most part. But I don't think anyone, you got from 11 to 15, you got the Wizards, the Knicks, the Pacers, the Pistons, and the Magic. Um, put a line through the Magic, Pistons, and Pacers. The Knicks put a line through. They're playing like shit. They, they, they look awful. They, they could make a run, but I, I highly doubt it. Um, D. Rose is now announced out, as we'll mention later. So the Wizards were only the only logical choice to sneak into a plane. And I don't think they will, Pro. So that, that's my East. Who do you have? Well, I thought I, I just ranked the top 10. So are you going to rank the top 10 or are we going to do that later? No, I don't need the top 10. I just want to know, know who's your, who's your team scraping in. Oh, scraping in? Who's out? But I mean, basically, I assume you're, you're probably your top eight. So you got Miami, Chicago, Philly, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Boston, Toronto, and Brooklyn are, are pretty much locks to make the playoff slash play in. Um, and then you know it's pretty much out of Charlotte, Atlanta, Washington, and New York for who gets the next two spots. Yeah. So I don't have anybody right now that's out jumping in. All right. So that's that's one. So like my top, my bottom two in the East to get in at 9-10 in this order would be uh, Atlanta and Charlotte. So I don't, I don't have anybody scraping up. Like, like you said, New York's out, Indiana's out, Detroit's out, Orlando's out, in my opinion. And Washington, right now they're only a game out. But I think that with the depletion of players they sent out and with Porzingis not knowing his status injury-wise. Well, he's hurt again, right? Um, he's out today. I just yeah, read. He's got something going yeah. on again. Yeah. 
you know, and Unsell basically, Unsell Jr. basically, like, into the media was like, yeah, he's coming, you know, just basically what they say with the Mavericks. Oh, he's coming along well and everything's okay. And, you know, we're going to, you know, ramp it up and all that. So I don't think that, I think that they're going to get a depletion of sort of value what they're, what they're going to see. I like Charlotte. They're not playing great, but like they're together. Like they're tough. They play. They got some talent. And when, Atlanta sort of under, you know, so, sort of underachieved, obviously one of the most underachieving teams in the league. But I think they're going to start hitting it a little bit come, you know, this, this next six weeks or so. So I, I have Charlotte and Atlanta sort of scraping in uh, with, with the bottom two of the uh, of the East. Who do you have in your top 10? The exact top 10 that's there right now. Yeah. Um, I didn't I didn't do a I didn't do a number top 10. I just wanted to do. My number one seed that I think will finish number one is Miami Heat. Um, they are number one right now. Reason being is I checked the strength of schedules for both of those. I think um, Chicago have the second toughest schedule in the league, so I don't think they hold on to one. Um, they do have some injuries um, still with Ball and Caruso, some point guard issues at times, so I think that'll that'll hurt them over the course of the season. But, I mean, the Rosen's balling, so they are playing very, very well, but that's why I went with Miami. Um, Miami have a bit of an easier schedule. They're playing really well. They've finally gotten healthy for the first time. They're 7-3 and three in their last 10. They're starting to play better. So I think the Bulls might fall a little bit. Um, Philly, maybe a smoky. Maybe they go on a big run now with, with, with Harden and Embiid. Um, Milwaukee may be the other one, but I think Miami will hold on for, for one. Who, who do you have finishing number one in the East? You know me, I, I love the Miami Heat, but I have Milwaukee. Uh, that's gonna, I think they're going to okay, big jump. The second half. Yeah, they're yeah, three yeah. games behind at the moment. So, yeah, possible. They do have pro strength of schedule, toughest schedule in the league. <laughs> Bogues, look, your, your analytical genius I, I took advantage of because I didn't think that you would be up to task. You have put all of NASA behind you and your stats get gathering for this project. I didn't do that homework. I just sort of figured how they're playing, what their roster is like injury wise, you know, if anybody made any trades or whatnot, but I did not look at strength of schedule. I should have, but I think Milwaukee, you know, those teams, especially the really good ones that had injuries and things like that banged up, but nothing totally serious except the Lopez deal. I think that they'll start ramping it up, playing well. I like Miami, but you know they're a little inconsistent as well at, at times. And I don't know if they could they they could hold on up top. And nobody wants to see Miami win more than I do. I love them, but I think Milwaukee's going to sort of rise up a little bit. I think they're going to finish number one. You can see that it's a massive jump for them. They've been a little inconsistent at times too. But they, I think we noted it maybe five episodes ago that they haven't had their their big three on court as much as other teams have. Um, they have injuries early you mean, on. You mean they didn't trade Giannis because they weren't in first place? What the fuck? <laughs> Not yet. Or Firebud. <laughs> yeah, Firebud. Jeez, that's crazy. Yeah, but uh, yeah, they, their big three hasn't played a lot together. Early on in the season, I think they have now. Recently they have, but they when they when their record wasn't great, and they were they were down 8, 9, 10 at one point in the season. So they, um, they got healthy and have bounced back. All right, the West... This one's a tough one because I don't know the psyche of – like I'm going to guess the psyche of some teams, um, whether they're tanking or not. And I pretty much have – I mean, if we go one through eight right now, it's Suns, Warriors, Grizzlies, Jazz, Mavericks, Nuggets, Timberwolves, Clippers. I think they're all in. I think Clippers are in for sure. The Lakers have a tough strength of schedule, so I doubt they fall out just because it's the Lakers. So I think they're in. That 10th spot I think is a wrestle between Portland – San Antonio and New Orleans. I think that Portland. I'm picking the Pelicans, bro. I'm going. They're going from. 12, they're going to go from twelve, and they're going to scrape into a plane. Here's why: they haven't had a lot of success lately. A lot of turmoil there. Davis left the Zion thing. I think they're invested in trying to at least get something positive out of this season. I don't think that matters as much to Portland and San Antonio. I think San Antonio's pretty much in tank mode. I mean, develop their young guys. But, I mean, they've won their last two, funnily enough. They could sneak in. But I think that they're, they're not too worried about a 10-seed playing with the success they've had the last 20 years. I don't think that's on their whiteboard. Like, hey, we got to get this 10-seed. Whereas in, in New Orleans locker room, I think it is. Um, Portland, maybe. Um, the one positive they have is they've got the easiest remaining schedule in the league. But I think they'll drop some of those games. I think they lose to bad teams. I think they play better against... You know, teams that they're not supposed to beat, they come out harder, it seems. Whereas 
when they play teams they're supposed to beat, they don't play as well. That's what I've noticed. But they have the easiest strength of schedule. So a betting man might bet them to get in. Um, but they are almost in a rebuild as well, you know, getting rid of McCullum. But I, I think New Orleans with McCullum, they're starting to play a little bit better. They're six and four in their last 10. Uh, they've got a nice scoring balance now. They've got a, a legit number one scoring option. Ingram also up there. Valentunas is starting to have some good games again. They've got some good pieces around them. So I think they're going to sneak in, pro. It's it's kind of a bit of a smoky. They're down, down in 12 at the moment, but only one game out from 10. And you don't never want to bet against the Spurs and the Blazers have the easiest strength of schedule. So I'm probably picking the third best option, but that's what I'm going with, bro. Yeah, Bogues, I, I got your sort of sentiment. I'm, I'm sort of the same thing. I think the Pelicans will get in. I think they're going to finish above the Lakers. I think they're going to finish at mm. nine. I think LA finishes at 10. I'm going to go on that uh, prediction that I had about two, uh, six weeks ago that, you know, Lakers might bounce out of 10, to be honest, but I'll put them at 10, you know, just to say, hey, they might, st- they might stick around. Um, the biggest thing here is, like you said, New Orleans, they're playing pretty well. McCollum's a huge boost. I think they have some good young pieces that have been playing well, that's been developing throughout the year. Um, my big thing with Portland is they basically gave away McCollum for nothing. They didn't really get much in return, and they traded away some of the assets they got in, in that deal. So I think they're going to definitely be depleted. Willard's out for the year, so you know what's he really going to you know, there's really nothing going on there. And I think they're going to drop out. Now, San Antonio, they can go two ways. A, they're not going to be bad enough to challenge for a top three pick. So they might sell it to the young guys. Look, we're going to battle. We're going to battle for this 10 spot. And I'll tell you what, with Lakers strength of schedule and San Antonio may be saying, hey, fuck this. We're just going to like, we're going to teach our young guys how to scrap to try to get into something and play for something. And, and maybe not go in a total tank mode, that they might be able to sneak. Right now, I'll have the Pelicans and Lakers 9 and 10, and San Antonio is going to be at the, uh, the first team out. But I, it wouldn't surprise me if LA dropped out of this, but I'm going to go with you and just say they're going to go to 10. Hey, folks, any risers, in your opinion, in, in your 10 uh, for the West, like any big risers that are currently in like 8th that might finish 4th or – Anything like that? Did you notice in your sort of... Um, you know who I want to give a shout out to the Clippers? They're 31 and 31, but they've lost two of their max guys and they're battling, man. Like I, I got to give a shout out to them because I, I saw their game last night even though there was some dumb plays late, but they, they battle, man. They just they just haven't given up. I, I'm really... They've kind of impressed me. I thought that, I thought it was going to go south. I mean, you lose Kawhi and PG. It's equivalent of losing, you know, look what, look what Brooklyn, what's happened to Brooklyn, right? Without without their stars, like awful, awful, and they've battled. So I think I don't know what the word is on Paul George, um, Kawhi. There were rumors he might be back late, but then they're saying he's not. If they get one of those guys back, I, th- I could see them climbing a little bit. I could see them climbing maybe to you know they're only two games behind. Uh, what is it? Uh, not even two games. They're a game and a half behind Minnesota above them, and then they're about four games behind, four and a half games behind Denver. So they could they could maybe move up out of that plane and bump. Tim Bulls down depending on when PG comes back and if he can come back healthy. But I've been impressed with them. But otherwise, not really. Um, I think Utah's starting to play better. But yeah, my, look, my one seed is pretty obvious. It's Phoenix, it's Phoenix Suns, but the outlier is Chris Paul's injury. So, you know, he tends to be banged up going into playoff series every season. And that's usually, you know, the story with him. So you want to see him healthy to see them you know, have that push going. He had one of his more healthiest seasons last season with the Suns push. So you want to see him um, get there with the team they've built, but he's reportedly out four to six. So I think they'll they'll drop some games, but I think their buffer pro, I think they're six, they're six games ahead of Phoenix. I think that's enough of a buffer. I don't think the Warriors are really care about trying to get the one. I don't think it matters at this point. If they can get it, great, but they're not going to go, you know, pedal to the floor trying to do it and risk injuries. And I think the Warriors towards the end with the last five or six games, they'll start to monitor their health load going into the playoffs. So they might drop a few games late in the season. So I think Phoenix, I mean, do you see them dropping out from, from one? No, I don't. It's six games and, you know, they're going to get beat by some teams. They obviously had a chance to beat that are right around them. You know, if they play Golden State or Memphis or something like that, or, or Miami or something like that. But, I think they could sort of stick in and, and beat a lot of teams as well, even with, you know, even with their backups at, uh, you know, backup at point guard. One team I 
think that's going to rise up a few spots is the Dallas Mavericks. I think that they could rise up to three from five. It's just something about them, Bogues. Like, I don't know what it is. Like, they, they're they flowing. They play together. They're all, you know, obviously, Luke, you know, they're only as good as Luca is going to be. But, you know, they've got, they got shooting. They got defense. They play hard. They play for each other. It seems like there's no turmoil or anything like that they're dealing with. And Memphis, the one thing that scares me, every other week there's an injury scare with John Morant. Do you notice that? Yeah, it's like, the way he plays you know, too. Yeah, it's the way he plays. Yeah. Mm. I just, you know, I, look, God God bless him. I hope he stays healthy the whole time. But the way he plays, you know, banged up here and there maybe. But I just like the way Dallas is going at it. And I think that they're going to beat up. Now, Utah has been up and down. I think they'll see a little bit of stability. But losing Joe Ingles might be a big problem for them, you know, at times losing these closer games. But I can see Dallas rising up a little bit. Uh, no one, No one really from the East. Besides the Bucks, obviously, and that's just a pipe dream going to one from four. But I think that, uh, you know, look out for Dallas. I, I could see them making a run. Yeah, but that's a big jump, bro. They're, they're what are they, yeah. five and a half 14. behind yeah. three at the moment. So um, that'll be a big jump with, with 20, odd, you know, 20 odd games remaining or t- whatever it is. Um, That'll be a huge jump if they did that, and that means that that means you're picking them to start rolling and go on a big run here. And, and look, I like the way they play too. I think they they play together. They look like their understanding of roles has been solidified for everyone. Everyone knows what they're there to do, and 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 obviously that's not sugar coated. It's Lucas' team, and then play a role around it. And we're going to win games. They're starting to figure that out. So um, I think possibly I don't know if I get to three. I think the four is important for them. I think trying to get that home court advantage for them. Um, in the first round would be very, very important, especially, you know, we talk about the Jazz home fans. I think if it's a Jazz Mavericks playoff series right now with Jazz having home court, I'd probably tip the Jazz, to be honest with you. Um, but if the Mavs got home court, I could definitely see them winning that series. So I think that that's really important for them if they can jump that. But it just seems like home court's not as important for teams anymore, Pro. Like, I don't know if it's the the bubble has caused it or – you know, if it's if it's just the coronavirus, I, I don't know. But it just back in the day, teams used to fight tooth and nail for that home court, right? And and you just don't, it just doesn't seem like it's as important anymore, right? Well, y- certainly through the bubble, it wasn't. Last year, you know, with COVID and the fans just getting let in, and you know, you got a sense that it wasn't as important. But this year might start turning the corner on getting back to what things used to be as far as your home court. I do agree that the, the bubble is a joke with home court. That didn't matter. And then last year, just again, just a different feeling. This year, it, you might just see a little bit more going back to what it used to be as far as like having that real advantage playing at home, the travel, things like that. So we'll, we'll see. I, I think it. I think it'll be a little bit like I think it'll be a little bit closer to normal. Yeah, I mean, I've just noticed it the last couple of years, so um, I think it definitely, definitely will be ramped up um, with with the normality getting back at least in the NBA and the world. So, uh, All Star Game, we spoke about it a little bit on the call in. I didn't really watch any of it. I watched actually a lie. I watched the probably the last. Who was it? Um, I watched Cats Rack and whoever he beat um, in that final it was kicked from the Clippers. Was it? Um, Canard? Yeah. I didn't see it at all. I think all, it was Canard. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, Cat shot the piss out of the ball. It was, like, it was, it was amazing to see and shout out to a big fellow winning the three-point contest. So I saw basically five minutes of that because I just happened to turn it on and it was finishing. Didn't watch a dunk contest. Saw all the tweets around that and the hoopla and <clears throat> the attention and saying it was one of the worst ones ever. And I think your point on calling was everything's everything's being done. It's it's just the dunk contest. I mean, what else? There's not many things you can do to be creative anymore. You can lift the basket 12 feet like Dwight Howard. You can blow out a candle. You, you know, once I started getting all that stuff involved, I was kind of already starting to steer away from it. But I don't necessarily blame the players neither. Um, I mean, these, those poor bastards got shit hung on them for the next – 48 hours by everyone. I mean, Shaq and everyone was killing them. So then does that, does that make it even less appealing to anyone next year, right? Um, but I don't, I don't know how they fix it. I don't know what they do. Um, my suggestion on the calling was maybe you bring up some G League guys. You have a G League versus versus the NBA because there's some, there's some dunkers in the G League. 
right? There's there's some athletes in the G League, and they're, they're unfortunately all they are is athletes for the most part. They can't make that jump to to adjust into playing in the NBA. But the, there's some athletes. Maybe that that'll bring out something. I mean, prize money doesn't change things, and then then you factor in. Um, obviously the all-star game which I didn't watch um, it's just you know it's, it's just not something that I enjoy and now for the young people out there you might correct me you might really enjoy the weekend and celebrity and the hoorah and it was like Super Bowl weekend for basketball I get it I think it's two different subsets of fans I think it's the the, the casual celebrity loving I follow basketball because my friends and fans love the all-star game I think for the most part I could be wrong let me know listeners I think the purists don't enjoy watching it for, for basketball reasons um, and that's kind of where we're at. And, and apparently the second worst or one of the worst uh, rating All-Star games ever is a bit of a concern. Uh, my whole thing is one fix I would have is stop fucking with it. I think the three-point shootout is great. Keep it as it is. Um, stop ad- adding extra racks and money balls and do a backflip before you hit a three and all that bullshit. Just keep it, keep that the same. That's one of the purest events in professional sports at an All-Star game that I love to watch because I can compare to the – Larry Bird era, hey, Larry hit this many when he shot it. Hey, you know, this guy shooting, you know, Cat hit this many. Like, it's fantastic to compare eras. Really the only event left you can you can properly compare eras, right? Whereas the dunk contest has different variables now, better shoes, better athleticism, better equipment, all that kind of stuff. Um, and same with All-Star Games. So I think the three-point shootout, just leave it. Skills challenge is okay, but just stop messing with it. My last suggestion before I let you fill in pro was was maybe I think it's just a one day event. I think it is. I think um I think you start in the morning. You have have your celebrity game in the morning. Um, then you have your rising stars challenge. Have a little break, and then you do three you know th- uh, skills challenge to th- three point shootout to dunk contest to feature event main event all star week um, all star game. See you later. Um, I think the weekend is probably a little bit too much pro, but give us your little spiel about the weekend you paid no attention to. Zero, zero point zero. I didn't even watch any highlights of it, so I have no fucking idea. Now I know Kyra, I know Steph made sixteen threes, but that's all I know, just because it was on Twitter. But I didn't watch one highlight of it. I didn't know, you know, you, obviously, and you know my feeling of it. Uh, with All Star Weekend, I agree they 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 got to do something where it's like one day. I, I I do agree with the one day. Look, NBA players have usually you have. That Thursday off, Friday off, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, back to your team probably Tuesday night or Wednesday, you know, for the for the rest of the week. So you know, you, you only have a limited time off anyway. So for the players, just get them in, get them in and get them out. As far as the events in, in general, like I would I would say I would I would ask that the dunk contest. I think it, there's no reason for it uh, anymore. I, I just think that you you've done everything. Like you said, the you know, maybe bring in the D League guys, the G League guys, whatever. Maybe bring out four guys off the street that aren't playing a professional league right now that are just like amateur dunkers that like they're all over YouTube or or TikTok or whatever, and then bring them against four NBA people. Maybe just do like a follow the leader where like, you know, one per the first person dunks and everyone's got to follow it. And then, you know, you go through that. I don't know. But like whatever they're doing now, it it you know, it's broken. It, it no, and the misses you know, too. I forgot to mention the misses just f- fucking kill me. Like it just kills the whole momentum. I got, I got to try and do the same dunk, miss, 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 miss. You know, and then by the time they do it, it could be the best dunk in the world, right? By the time they finally make it, everyone's like, oh yeah, thank, thank, thank God you made it. <laughs> yeah, I would do a follow the leader. I would do the follow the leader. You get one chance at it. So like horse, you get a horse dunk. Yeah, for Duncan. I, I would do horse. Like I would do horse. Period. As an event, they used to do that with like. You could see it on YouTube, like Pistol Pete Maravich and like George Gervin yeah, or cool something event. at it. Yeah, like I would do that. Or a, or a horse follow the leader dunk where like you have five dunkers, you get five rounds. The, the first guy comes up with his dunk. You Everybody's going to try it and then they score it. And then, and then you do it with every dunker leads it and then everybody follows it. And it's quick. You get one minute, one dunk, that's it. Once you started getting the time limit, as many dunks as you want, it's bullshit. I, it's Look, it was a special event from the time Dr. J dunked from the free throw line through Michael Jordan versus Dominique Wilkins. You know, those things were so, Vince, Carter, Vince Carter. They were yeah. special. Sean Camp, but yep. Sean Camp, but the D Brown, you know, D, the D Brown dunk, like that stuff was a special time. But every dunk's been done. Not a lot of the great players do it anymore. Like you would have, I would say 80% of the participants usually were like all-star level players. 
now you have and no offense to the players that do it now but you just don't have that same you know feeling as far, as far as a dunk contest is concerned imagine michael jordan the best player of all time like was in like three or four dunk contests like you know larry bird one of the top players of all time won it like three years in a row like his three point contest it's pretty cool to sort of have that like elite level player participate but you just don't have that anymore i think that's a good would, fix that's a good fix though i think that's just probably get get the names involved again you know i think that 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 might save the events like get the big time names um but i think i think it's gone past that cuz they don't you know let, let's say they don't want to embarrass themselves or be laughed at if they don't do well and i think that's it gets shit from everyone um so people just sit it out yeah so horse it up horse you know the horse event the horse dunk event and coming from a horse that's telling you to do a horse <laughs> event but like those two and that that's what i would do to try to fix it I always said that, like, you should do it. You should publicize the All Star Game at, to comp- to make it more competitive. Like, make make it like two million a person, but the losing team gets like twenty grand, like each person. Like, make it real. But, but like, they don't give a fuck. Like, uh, there's forty no fifty million a year. No. Yeah, they don't care. And you can put as much money as you want, and those superstars don't care. And I get it, and they shouldn't. And to be honest, like I said, I used to always love those competitive All Star Games. Because they really went at it. But to be honest, I don't want to see a fucking my favorite player or my favorite team if I'm a fan blow his fucking knee out, God forbid, in a fucking all-star game because they were competing. I sort of know why, but it's just, it's unwatchable basketball. It's unwatchable. Now, that new rule they put in, they, they got from the TBT where they, they figure out how many points they're going to score at the end. That's a pretty cool niche that they, they put in there, but I'm just not a fan of the whole deal, but whatever. Yep. We'll have that. We'll use this clip. We'll do a podcast next year for the All Star Game, I assume. But uh, officiating, pro. Um, I had someone text me that's in the league talk about this. Uh, it was a late add to the run sheet. Slowly reverting back to the old, pro. The, I've noticed it a little bit in the last couple of games, but they were, you know, especially the the the, the reach out shooting foul and a lot of the flopping going on. Um, it's starting to get caught a lot more now. Um, I, I think we, I think you probably talked about it when we talked about it in the preseason about how points of emphasis will always be very strict in the first month or two, and then it just slowly fizzles out. I mean, are we seeing that? I don't think it's gone to the extremes yet of of James Harden shooting, you know, thirty free throws, but it's starting to, you know, those whistles are starting to get blown more for the for the shenanigan type shit. I don't know if you've noticed it. Noticed it a little bit, yeah, for sure. I, I noticed the inconsistency of it. You know, like, look, if they're all going to do it, fine. But, like, some call it, some don't. The worst thing about it, as far as a teacher, like you're, when you're teaching players and you're teaching them certain things, where, like, what are you going to get away with versus what you're not going to get away with? And it's tough because you want everything to be legal. But, yeah, I do agree that I, I have seen some of these stuff called when they said that they were not going to call it as much. and. And it's just every year it's the same stuff. It's ah, uh, where this is a point of emphasis, da da da. And then at all levels, college is the same way. Points of emphasis this year, and then they just go away from it. Two months in, a month, you know, whatever it is, you know, by the time playoffs start or whatever, it's out, it's done. So yeah, I've, I've been noticing that a little bit too. Yeah, I wonder if they'll if they'll retweak it, but um, yeah, I mean, shit, the Philly going to be shooting forty five free throws a game from two guys if that's the case because um, they got two of the biggest foul drawers in the league that that do do sometimes engage in the shenanigans of it um, whether you agree with it or not they're just playing by the rules trying to get the referees to put them to the line but it is starting to kind of tweak and, and I just hope it doesn't keep going that way into the playoffs because then we watching watching free throw contests again which no one no one wants to watch all right Kemba Walker. He's going to be sat out again, pro. <laughs> so second time this season. They put out an announcement saying that, um, for those not familiar, earlier on in the season, he got sat for about five or ten games and they went they went even worse than they were with him in the lineup. So they brought him back. He came back, had some decent games up and down. But I guess they've now said, we're going to sit you for the rest of the season. We're going to allow you to work out for next season. You can stay in shape and be around the team and all that kind of stuff. And now Kemba's... He's not a he's not a bad locker room guy, so it's nothing to do with that. I think they just want to play the young guys. I think they're in full tank mode. But the reason why I think this is an important issue to discuss, this is the flip side of the Ben Simmons asking out Saga Pro. So this is the other side of the coin where now you've got a team saying, 
we're going to pay you, you know, you, you can be around, but we don't want you to play. Um, now, imagine he was going into a free, agent, free agency year, which he potentially is, they could buy him out, I assume, or, or, or waive him or whatever. That affects your value. Um, it can affect your confidence. It can affect your, what if he was playing for a national team in the off season? What if he needs to be in form? What if he's 32 coming off an injury? It's the flip side of the coin and it, you know, it shows the hypocrisy of, of some of these teams, bro. Yeah, for sure. I, I think this is a, a, a black mark for the league. It's a black mark for – not a high-level black mark, but it's just, a, it's just not a good – it's not a good look. Look, when, when you sign a guy, okay, sometimes you sign a guy with good intention. A coach is going to play you. You're going to do well here. You're going to be adored. We're good. Let's go. And then you figure out a month into it that, that this player isn't it. You know, it's not fitting. It's not working for some reason. Now, I don't know why he's not working. He should. He's a pretty good player. He's still got some juice left in the tank. But to sit the guy, and I saw this with Horford last year uh, with Oklahoma City, but they got rid of him in the offseason in a trade and got him back to Boston. But I I don't understand this, where why you wouldn't buy him out, try to trade him, first of all, do everything you can to trade him. Because you brought him in and you're like, look, we're giving you a two-year deal. He makes like 8.7 this year. I think he makes like 9.2 next year. Now, I wouldn't force it on the team because he is still an asset that they can move in a trade. Obviously, the asset isn't worth all that much because they couldn't move him in, at, at trade deadline this year. And he's basically going to be an expiring next, you know, next summer, uh, next year. So it, it's not great. It's not great because now he's going to work out you know, what are you going to do? You're just working out, you're doing nothing. And you're not playing, you know, you've already been through this shenanigans once where they like, uh, they benched you, they brought you back. I've seen this happen too, uh, close up where like they said, oh no, we're just going to shut you down. And then the team comes and said, no, no, we need you to play. And then you're like, what the fuck? Like, what do you want from me? And it is a bad look. If, I, if that was me and I, and I signed a player and look, you know, everybody lies about, you know, in free agency about what their role is going to be and all that stuff. It just is what it is. But like, if it didn't come true and you're not going to use them and you're going to scrap them, why not just say, look, we're going to try to move you to the best place we can. You know, we're going to get some money back. We're going to get something back for you. Second round pick, whatever it's going to be. And if we don't, we're just going to waive you. We'll, uh, we'll prorate your contract this year for a veteran minimum. And then you can have all your money next year or, or 80% of your money. And let's, you know, let's, let's get you somewhere so you could play the rest of the year. You're in shape. People would want you. Somebody's going to want to pick you up and we'll waive you. If we don't trade for you, we'll waive you. And then somebody can get you off the waiver wire. And then you could basically pick your own destination. I just think, I think this whole thing of, oh, just work out. You know, we're not going to play you. Just work out is, uh, it's not a good look. Well, it gives the players a, a now an you know an argument in saying, well, if 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 you guys are finding and criticizing Ben Simmons for him holding out, how can you then do this as a team and, and tell a guy? And most people say, well, yeah, well, he's still getting paid. Yeah, but he this could affect his future earnings. It could affect his form. It could affect his mental health. Whatever, right? So I think this hurts. This hurts the NBA's cause now. Going to a CBA, maybe bringing up that. You know the Ben Simmons thing is going to come up. Teams are going to be like, "Well, we want we want protection if we we sign a guy. We don't want him asking out one year in a contract." And then someone's going to say, "Well, here's an example: Kemba Walker. <laughs> All right, it's not a five year deal, but John Wall's another example. Um, this gives players a light to say it's a double standard. I think this hurts the NBA's case. The NBA, I think, should they need to do something for both sides of the coin. The Kemba Walker issue should not be allowed. I, I don't know whether that means. You know, teams maybe have that discussion quietly and just say, look, there's not a lot of minutes. We want to develop our young guys. We're still going to put you in the rotation, but probably not as much as you've been. Um, but it's just it just sucks for both sides, Pro, and I think there's some hypocrisy there on both sides of the coin now that players can utilize. Bones, the only thing with this whole thing is this, right? You run a team, and a player doesn't help you. Like, he helps you at first. You think he's going to help you, but he's not going to help you. Like, his attitude's good. But he's just not helping you. Your stat guy, your analytics guy goes, look, his plus minus or his net rating or any of the bullshit stat they want to throw at you. That, and, and then he's like, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll play this player instead. Like, 
at what point who's gonna who's playing God now and saying, well, is it the player's fault? Is it the team's fault? Is it nobody's fault? And he's just not playing. The only thing is, I don't want to give shit to a team. Like if it's just not working, like I would never tell a player just work out, be away from the team, but you're not going to show up. You're not going to like, I would always want them around the team because it's not a good look. Like, look, stay ready. You know, you're just not good enough to be in the rotation for one reason or another, but we want to use you just by like for 30 games left in the year, telling a player just work out, you know, just work out and and you're not going to be around the team like that. Like as far as game night or whatever, however that's going to be handled, I just think that's like it's hard to figure that out. But I'm I don't like it because I don't like them just saying, "Hey, work out. You're done for 30 games." Who the fuck knows what's going to happen in the next 30 games? And you might throw them in like in a week, and the guy might help you, and then you know how that shit goes. You'll just roll with them, like just to give up this early and say, "Yeah, it's a statement, right? <clears throat> it's just why, yeah. why put the statement out." You know, if you're if you're Thibs, you're the front office, you sit down with Kimber and say, hey, we're taking you out of the starting lineup. Um, we don't know where you're going to fit in the rotation. We want to try a few things. Obviously, we're not probably not going to make the playoffs. Um, we still want to battle. Just stay ready and be professional and be a good veteran for our young guys. We still want you around. We don't – but don't announce it publicly. And if the media asks, say, hey, yeah, we're, we're trying a different lineup. We're trying – we're, we're, we're not winning games. We're, th- we're, what are they, 25 and 35? Um, but don't put out a formal statement saying we're sitting this guy because now, now you look way worse. It's horrible. Um, and if he, if the player comes out and says, I think it's bullshit, uh, I'd, I think I can help the team, every player should say that because that's the competitive fire and, and then as a team you handle that. But I think if they sat him down and said, look, we like you in the locker room. Now, if he was being a douchebag in the locker room, or what, that's a different story, right? You say, we're just going to send you home, fuck off. But he's not that guy, reportedly. He, everyone says he's a good teammate and he's a professional. So you, can, you, want, you actually want those guys around even if they're not playing, right? If he's playing zero minutes, you want your rookies to see Kemba's still stayed with his routine. He knows he's not going to probably play much, but he's still doing – ticking all the boxes. He comes early, he gets his treatment in, he's getting in the ice baths and he's not playing. Now, if I'm a young fellow that's a rookie that's not playing many minutes – I've got no excuse and I've got someone now to say, shit, this guy's getting screwed. He was a former all-star. He's doing all the little things still and pr- knows he's not going to play. He got screwed out of uh, out of minutes. I, I have no excuse then. I think it actually helps your club culturally. So really puzzling statement by the New York Knicks. I don't, I don't get it. I totally agree. I, I think that this was just one that's discussed internally. If media start asking questions, you just answer as simple as we're trying a different rotation. Simple as that. And then they can write their articles about tanking. Like I think this was one about giving the media too much and giving them too much has made you look even worse in my opinion. So anyway, New York's New York shambles just continue. Speaking of New York, bro, you called it again. Um, New York City has a plan to phase out the vaccine mandate in the coming weeks, meaning – Free Kyrie, who'll be allowed to play in the playoffs. Um, I believe you you called this right um, a, a number of months ago. Yeah, come playoff time, uh, you said. I believe you said come playoff time, you thought that, that yeah. they would they would you know something would come out where the, where these pro athletes that aren't Kyrie's most notable can can get in and play yeah. in the playoffs for their cities. Yeah, my big thing is again now he's going to be able to play, and so I don't know. I, I guess Harden must have been a fucking, you know, boatload to handle or it was just not going to work. But to, I don't know, like from last week, man, just to give up like that and just to say, fuck it. Now Durant's coming back. Kyrie can play, you know, now what Ben Simmons is going to play for them. And I don't know, man. Please, Brooklyn Philly in the playoffs. Please, I pray. No, that'll be fantastic. I'll watch every one of those games. I would watch everyone Without question. Yeah. Without question. Yeah. And I think, I think, I honestly think, you know, hard on a side, I think Brooklyn, I like it. I do. I, I mean, I, I do because I'd like it knowing that now Kyrie can play. Before that, probably not. Like Kyrie being, you know, only being able to play road games in a playoff series, I didn't like the trade at that point. If you've got Kyrie and KD healthy and can play in all the games, I think Ben's the ultimate compliment to them. And I think he's going to help them. And I, and I like the – I think the throw-ins they got as well are underrated. And not spoken about enough. I think, um, you know, I think Seth Curry brings some more shooting to him. Um, so I think he'll help from that aspect. I think Drummond gives him a, a nice backup big. So 
I, I like it. Um, I think it. I think Harden maybe as of today, Philly win. But next year, year after year after, Ben's young. Harden's probably only got a couple of years at this level. I think. I think when it's all said and done, I think Brooklyn might come out looking good. Um, you know, if 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 Ben fulfills that role that I expect he will with those star, two stars next to him. But I, I pray to God we get uh, we get a Brooklyn Philly series because that'll be absolutely bonkers. No doubt, and and you know what, and this goes out to teams that want to bring in three great players. All right, news flash. They're going to be pains in the fucking ass to deal with. Newsflash. That's why you pay your coach $5 million a year and you pay the 72 other assistants in fucking polo shirts all that fucking money. Because you like the first sign of, oh, wow, he's, you know, he's not a team guy. No fucking shit. He's a fucking NBA superstar. Like they, like, they got to be handled differently than everybody else. So like, they're going to be, they're going to have to deal with this. Like James Harden, like you don't expect to, you know, this guy's not going to be like Kyle Corver. He's not going to be Harrison Barnes to deal with them, you know, where they're going to be ultimate professional and easy to deal with. And yeah, I'll do this. And yes, I'll do that. You know, like they, you, that's why you pay your staff and you have this plan of bringing these superstars in, to try to be like the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics in 08 and, you know, so on and so on. Like, yeah, it's going to be bumpy. But you can't quit the first sign of you can't throw the white flag up the, the first sign of like turbulent. That's why everybody gets paid so much money. You're in the NB fucking A. You're the best at what you do as a player, as a coach, as a player development guy or girl or whatever. Like everybody's a fucking the tops of what they do. And that's why you pay these people this money to deal with this shit. And I, I I agree with you. I think that that trade will be good for for Brooklyn down the road down the road. But when you want to trade for superstars, they're not going to be easy to deal with. And that's just the fucking bottom line. And you got to dig your feet in and be like, this is what we're going to deal with. And that's it. Or don't get them. Or just get all mid level exception players and just be happy. And, and and you know they'll come to practice on time and they'll say yes sir no sir. You know, but that shit ain't gonna happen. Speaking of which, what you just said about the big three, a, a Sixers employee leaked that the the tug of war for Alpha Dog in the Sixers locker room when Jimmy, Ben, and Joel were all together was a constant daily battle. And that, that leads into exactly what you said. Um, from this report, it said Ben was the alpha whenever Joel Joel wasn't in the room um, and cracking jokes and, and kind of was the forefront. And then as soon as Joel walked in, he would take over um, and be the – be the kind of instigator, the jokes, I'm the life of the room, life of the party. And then Jimmy would come in and trump them both. <laughs> <laughs> so this is coming from an you know, inside source from, from that was an employee there and basically just said with, with, with Jimmy Butler in the room, Ben pretty much disappeared according to reports. So that goes to your point of I just don't get, uh, you know, these those examples of like is it that hard to get along? You're both you're, – all three of you are max guys – and just just come together and win games. It's not going to change really your financial standing. It's not going to change. All right, you're not. Some reporter might say it's this guy's team, and some reporter might say it's that guy's team. It just seems so petty those those arguments um, that I just never understood. Like, why can't you just all buy into the greater good of the Philadelphia 76ers and winning a championship? And I just felt that was a pretty good tidbit to to throw in around around what you're saying with the big threes. That sometimes. It's not as easy as just getting three stars on paper analytically and saying, well, these guys would mesh perfectly. And the personalities are a very, very big part of that. Huge part of it. And it's the ego thing. It's social media. It's like everybody needs to be the top dog. It's, it's all of that. And look, it's not like, it's not like one player is going to average 25 and then the next guy is going to average 11. The way the game's played, the way the, the pace of the game and how many possessions there are in a game these days? You could have a you could have two guys averaging twenty five and another guy averaging eighteen. That's just sort of how it goes. I mean, you know, teams are scoring so much these days. That everyone's going to have a turn to do their thing, and then you're going to win. Everybody's going to make a shitload of money. Like, look, everybody goes through things. Like, you know, where you work, you go to your workplace, and you fucking hate the person or people that you work with. But you know what? You go home like you're away from them. So the fuck what? 
But like, if you get something that's working, look, if you're like, um, you know, if you're like, I don't know, if you're the Orlando Magic and you're dealing with, and you're, and you're, and you've got this problem where you're not winning games and you hate the players that you play with, I could see being, you know, a little pissed off. You're not winning. You're not happy. Maybe you don't like some of the players that you deal with, coach, whatever. But like, if you're like the Golden State Warriors and and you're there and you're like so pissed off that you're playing with like, you know, with Steph or with Draymond or with Clay, but you're winning games, you're making money, you're in a great city, and then you get to go home and you're away from those guys for three months, you know, two or three months in the offseason anyway. Like, I mean, I'm not dealing with it, so maybe it's, you know, it's hard to speak out of line like that, but, you know, it's just weird, man. It's not like you're fucking, it's not like you're moving shit around for a living. You're not a mover fucking moving desks and chairs up eight flights of stairs a day. You're playing NBA basketball, making a shitload of money in great cities, you know, with great restaurants or great people, you know, you're going to, everywhere you go, you're not going to like somebody. I mean, something's not going to be right, but just to fucking say I'm out, you know, I can see if you're getting beat, beat up every day, you know, this or that, or you're, you're, something's getting threatened. Like, but if you're just in an NBA city, come on, like you got to leave, especially if you got other p- people that could, you could win a shitload of games with. I don't know, man. It's it's tough, dude. I, I can't I can't wrap my head around. I can't it. sympathize with it. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks to watch from the outside. And we've, we've seen it. It happens. And this isn't just a new age thing. We saw it with your Mavericks back in the day with the Triple J's, Jim Jackson, Jamal Mashburn, Jason Kidd. You know, they were supposed to be the the next, the first real big three, all young, all all best in class rookies. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. If, the rumors are true around a, a certain singer or <laughs> whatever happened there. Oh, but, yeah, I heard about that, yeah. But, um, that. yeah, that, that imploded quickly. So it's not just a thing that's happening these days. It's, it's happened previously. I think it's just happening more these days because there's more big threes. Like, generally, they were all young at the time. They didn't come together as stars, but that never happened back in the day. So now we're seeing big a big three, you know, basketball-wise, also a big three ego-wise come together. There's going to be some issues, but – um yeah, it just just always sucks when you're when you're a fan like I am now, and you are seeing that, just thinking, man, just 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 suck it up, leave it at the door. You guys aren't going to get along off the floor and have the same hobbies and interests and the same thoughts on different things, whether it be social, political, whatever. Um, even the same football team, just get on with it because you guys are three very talented guys that can win a championship. But um, didn't go that way. All right, pro, you into NFTs? I don't even know what a fucking NFT is, <laughs> but like you know, like. The I, fungible yeah, I token, it's basically, um, you know, we've spoken about it a little bit. Essentially, you can get a video type um, unique highlight or unique uh, vision or headshot or cartoon. You can get whatever and it's it's unique to, to you buying it and it's supposed to be numbered and rare and it's got a value. Much like holding a physical piece of art, you can get it digitally. Anyway, the Aaron Fox involved in a pretty big NFT scan, bro, scam. Uh very, very head scratching. One point five million dollars gone. So he started an NFT. A um, bunch of people subscribed and bought and and signed up for it. Um, apparently, it wasn't built or fulfilled. Rest assured, though, pro Darren Fox has announced that he's not going to you know leave you guys hanging. That he invested, you know, I think some people invested three four thousand dollars. You will get a signed jersey for your troubles for losing your money. Oh, nice. So you don't come up empty handed. Uh, no, <laughs> but my question around this pro for a lot of listeners out there, they probably wouldn't wouldn't look at it from this lens. Do you think this is a family or friends thing that was running it on the side, and Fox most likely had no idea exactly what was going on, or do you think Fox had his paw prints over the daily happenings um, and knew what was going on? If you were a betting man, which one would you pick? If I had a guess, folks. It was, he had all the good intentions in the world. Somebody talked him into it. He probably heard NFT a million times. He might have a couple of players that are invested in it on his team, right? And then he's like, yeah, you know how it is in NBA and most young NBA players. Yeah, I'm in, I'll do it. And then figured out it was going to be some fucking work. And it'd be like, ah, fuck it, nah, let's just not do it. And then just close it down. I don't think somebody did it like without him knowing or behind his back. I think that he knew it. I think he knew about it, but then like he's like, you know, he put it, you know, he stuck his toe in the water and be like, you know what, ah, fuck this, this is too much work, and then just fucking scrapped it, and that's what I think. 
That's what I think would happen most likely. Do you think that do you think the opposite? Do you think somebody like did this without him knowing and No, this is how I think just, this is how I think it happened. I think Darren Darren probably like you said, NFTs are the new craze. I think he had a meeting with someone set up and they walked him through what they're gonna do, how they're gonna build it for about 30, 40 minutes, and he was probably on his phone for about half of it, not paying attention. And yeah, I think that they, he basically said, all right, cool, I love it, you guys handle it. And then I think it got to a point where he was just like, I'm going to can it because it's cost me money or I don't know what's going on. And it all imploded. That's what I think, bro. I think that's generally how these investments go. Yeah, I mean, your guess is as good as mine, but imagine like 1.5 million, nothing, no talk about giving money back. And he's going to give you a signed jersey, like a De'Aaron. Like people are dying for De'Aaron. Uh, for like, I gave you forty five. Like I, I gave you like thirty grand in this project or twenty grand, but I'm going to get a, a signed De'Aaron Fox jersey. Just sign card, bro. <laughs> just so I can, just so you can put your, the jersey up in your lounge room to further troll you how you lost three or four thousand dollars in a scam <laughs> every day when you wake yeah. up in the morning. Yeah, I'll put it up, and then I'll get a T-shirt that said. I'm out $32,000 and all De'Aaron Fox gave me was his fucking t-shirt and that's it with his signature on it. I would walk around with that t-shirt on. But yeah, that's bullshit, man. Or like, dart. And that's on your dartboard. Put it on my fucking dartboard. Like, like, and this is the thing about young, with young players, dude. Like, if you're going to say you're going to do something, be professional and do it. And if you, if, you, if you stick your head out and you say, you know what, this ain't right, I ain't going to do it, then have the professionalism to be like, look, I'm sorry it didn't work. Here's your money back. Even if you got to give some of your own money back because you either spent it in production or whatever you did, whatever, however that shit worked. Like, be professional. Own the fuck up. Man the fuck up and own it. Say, I made this mistake. I apologize. That's why, like, that's... It's not just young basketball players. Young people in general. Like, they'll just, like, ghost you. And they'll be like, ah, oh, fuck it. And they'll move on to the next thing. And not understanding that there are people with their hard-earned money that gave you fucking one point five fucking million dollars in the middle of a fucking pa- well, at the end of a pandemic, they give you one point five fucking million. And you know, I know that you scratch your ass with that as a player making thirty plus million, but come on, oh, refund the money. You, you get, yeah, re, you, re, refund at, the at, money. At a, at a minimum, refund the money and send the jersey. In my opinion, okay. refund the money, refund the money, fucking t-shirt, uh, fucking jersey. Like, like, say, hey, look, give them back. Like, let them stay, stand in the tunnel. Give them tickets. Like, make it like, say, you know what? I fucked up and I'm owning it. And I'm not only doing that, I'm, I'm also going above and beyond and say, I'm sorry. This won't happen again. And thank you for fucking investing in me. I, I really appreciate it. But just ghosting them with a the fucking jersey, which probably half of them he won't even sign. It'll be like his boy or his boy's boy. Fucking <laughs> It'll be signing. the guy running the NFT <laughs> project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you've already got him on salary. I'll, I'll just pay you to sign all those now instead of making my <laughs> yeah. NFT that never existed. But yeah, um, if you invested in it and you're a listener to Rogue Bogues, let me know. I'd love to hear your thoughts around the Darren Fox NFT. All right, NBL news, real quick, pro. We've got we've got a bit of trouble brewing in um, in Illawarra, pro. So they're they're one of the championship favorites. They have they have a team that's basically I mean year to year pretty similar. They brought back a lot of their stars: Tyler Harvey, Justine and Jessup, Froling made some other tweaks of hearing Colangelo who's involved with that team pro um, which one they the dad or the the younger guy the guy that got fired from Philly I think Brian mm. okay Brian okay got it yeah I, th- I think uh, from what I've heard he's not too happy um, with with ongoings there I believe he might be in the country um, I need to get that confirmed but there is some there is some issues going on down there front office wise um, so Story goes something like this, that um, there's there's a player, I'm not going to name the player or the, or the staff member, but there was a player that was signed um, and it was against the head coach, Brian Gorgian's wishes at the time. The reason why that player's, the player was signed is because the player's girlfriend's father is good friends with someone who's pretty influential in the front office slash ownership group pro. Um, so much so that that's caused some turmoil with with Coach Gorgian. It's caused some turmoil with the roster. There are rumors that the player doesn't fit as well as as, as they thought, but it wasn't a decision of, of of Brian Gorgian. So 
you see this in overseas leagues more than the NBA, right? Because you're not generally not going to you do favors in the NBA, but you still have your product on court. And look, this player isn't isn't horrible by any means, but it, it, it just goes to show that there is a bit of conflict there. And I know Brian Gordon's out of contract this off season. Does that change what he does? Um, does it change what what's going on in the ownership group slash front office? But there are some some rumors burbling down there, pro, and, and you never want to hear things like that that someone was you know signed got the nod over another player because the auntie's uncle's friend baked cookies with them when they were kids or whatever the whatever the excuse is. But that's uh you know pretty concerning for for a team that um, a lot of people had picked as championship favorites. I still think they'll be in the mix, but. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're currently sitting four slash fifth and, and not doing as well as they thought they would be at this point in the season, bro. Two things. First of all, I need a friend that has a friend that's an influential person in a front fucking office and ownership group. <laughs> that's what I need. I don't have any of those friends. My, all of my friends are fucking deadbeats. Um, if I'm Brian Gorgian, I'm out. I'm out. Fuck that shit. I'm out. Because like, you, if, you're, if it's against your wishes, you know, it's not presented to you it's a, it was presented to you and you said no, and this guy gets fucking signed. And w- w- after you said no, and he got signed because of this, I'm fucking out. First of all, either fire that GM or you got to go. That's it. I mean, it, 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 like an organization doesn't run that way. It, it doesn't. It fucking doesn't. You got to man the fuck up and run an organization right. And this is what it goes back to. It you know, goes back to what we always say. You either have culture or you have signs in your locker room that says you have culture. Because like when real culture means like when shit, when no one's looking, you're doing the right fucking thing. And by signing a player, because, you, you know, there's girlfriends fucking friends with some guy that's, you know, that's influential. Fuck that shit, man. I, I'd fight. The GM's got to go. The GM's got to go or, or fucking Gordon's got to go. Or Gordon's got to say, I'm, I'm out of here. Because obviously... He's going to be a hot commodity in free agency if he wants to go. But that's, of course, you will. That's fine. Yeah. That, and yeah, this is this is a fine. team. You know, the the Illawarra Hawks are somewhat hard done by at times. It's a very small market, very small town. So the small market mentality, we, we're always getting screwed. And, and at times, probably right. But a lot of trouble the last decade with ownership, different ownership groups getting involved, going bankrupt, team moving, team going under. Are they staying? Are they going? What's the deal with the arena? Blah blah blah. So a lot of turmoil there. My opinion is with small markets, your room for error is so much less than a big market. Now, this team pro is in the same state as the Sydney Kings. They're, they're um, you know, 80, 90 minute drive from, from, from where we play. So it's an it's a, it's a in-state rival. As a Sydney Kings minority owner, I want the Illawarra Hawks to do well. I need them to do well because that in-state rival is a beautiful thing. It's a, right up the highway. It's it's the it's it's the Warriors slash Kings or LA slash Sacramento rivalry, right? Um, I, I I want them to do well. I want them to get you know to a point where they are now competitively, but sustain that. But when you hear these kind of things, you know whether they're whether it's a half truth, whether there's a bit of truth to it, whatever. You don't you don't want these things to continue to happen or small market because you can't recover as quick. Look, Melbourne United, Perth Wildcats. Sydney Kings, you know, LA Lakers, New York Knicks, they can make these big fuck-ups and put a Band-Aid on them pretty quickly because they're a big market, um, much more sustainable to make mistakes. Small markets, you have no room for error. So in the NBL, NBL terms, Cairns, Taipans, Illawarra Hawks, Tasmania, um, Jack Jumpers, Pro's team, um, NBA, you know, Indiana Pacers, um, Milwaukee Bucks to an extent, you know, those small markets, New Orleans Pelicans, they can't, the, those errors backlog them for five years. Whereas those errors for the Lakers might be a year or two, which we're seeing now the Lakers. So that's just my point. I, you know, I have an incentive to have the Laura Hawks do well. I hope there's no truth to that at all, but it's from a pretty reliable source that, you know, I'm not going to name who it is, but a pretty reliable source that there are some tensions there. And we'll watch this space. We'll see if we'll see if Brian Gorgian stays on and they, they potentially could be a finals team that go to the grand final again and everything gets swept under the rug, but um, not, not good anyway. And just finally on the NBL Pro, some asshole – Broke into Nathan Sobey's home and stole his bronze medal. So I just wanted to give that a yeah, just wanted to give him a, give that a quick shout. Out. I just saw it on socials before I jumped on this podcast. Um, so his house got robbed. I assume you know someone knows who he is, and I think they robbed him when he was playing last night <laughs> during the game. 
that's the time to rob a professional athlete. Most most people, you know, unfortunately do. I think Zubat's got robbed during a game as well, not long ago in LA. But um, yeah, they've, they've out of everything they've stolen a medal, which they can really not do much with. I mean, what are you doing? You can't sell it anywhere because everyone's going to know you stole it. You can't melt it, and you're going to get nothing for it anyway. So please return it, you idiot. I mean, it's 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 some it's a historical medal for Australia. Um, it's obviously something that Nathan Serbia would be immensely proud about. So anyone listening to this, if you hear about any idiot in Queensland or Brisbane area with a bronze medal, there's probably a 99.99% chance it is Nathan Sobey's medal. So alert the authorities and, and get that medal back for uh, for Nathan Sobey. So hopefully that all ends well, bro. Sure. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, most, most of these things that have some fucking one-liner and joking about it, that's, that's some fucked up shit, especially national team. Gold, I mean, bronze medal. I mean, come on, man. That's oh, people that's that's pretty bad. that break breaking into a house is the lowest of low anyway. But then stealing things that are sentimental to a person that really have no value to you, like what do you what what are you going to do with that? You going to chuck it on eBay and we'll get five hundred bucks for it, and then get arrested after, or you're going to you know put it in in newspaper list? Like, what are you doing with it? You can't do anything with it. So it's like people that rob rob houses and steal you know, a, a, a collection of X, Y, Z that you know it's numbered and you can't sell it because you're getting caught. It's like you just, you're just stealing it because you're an idiot. But it could be drug affected, could be who knows, who knows, but it's just, it just hurts your heart. Tell it to Ben Simmons. <laughs> a low blow, for it, bro. Uh, he's going to get back yeah. on the court. He's, he's apparently the mental health stuff reportedly is fine. He's got a bit of back issues returning to play. So he's going to, I think he'll be back on the court within a week or so and, Maybe he can lead us to a gold in, in 24. We'll see. But um, I hope so, man. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, I hope he recovers. But um, top five in the NBL, in my opinion, probably set. Top four go to the finals, obviously. I think the top five set. Um, we have uh, Illawaras, uh, Illawarra Hawks, Sydney Kings, Melbourne United, Southeast Melbourne Phoenix, and the Perth Wildcats. Uh, it is a wrestle for who's going to be out. I I don't know. I mean, i gotta, I got to pick the Kings because they're my, my team. To me, it's out of uh, the Illawarra Hawks and Southeast Melbourne Phoenix, but the Phoenix just won last night. They're, they're in second. Um, it's going to be a tight race. I think that everything below that is is pretty. It's going to be pretty tough for the fans of those teams in six, seven, eight, nine, ten um, to make a run and jump into that into that top five. So that's my pick. My not going out on a limb, but I think the top five set from now. It's going to be one of the a formula of those top five teams that end up in the top four. Pro stats, useful or useless? Let's see if you know the answer to this. So you saw the NBA top 75 team, right? Was announced. Okay. There's only one championship team that did not have a player on the top 75 team, bro. You know who that was? I'm going to guess. The Detroit, Pist- the Detroit Pistons, not the Isaiah Thomas one, but the one with Chauncey Phillips on it? Yes, correct. Oh, wow. Well nice. done. Yeah. Nice. Not one player in the top 75 on that team, pro. Yeah. Um, I guess, I don't know if that's, I think it can be seen somewhat as a compliment, to be honest. I mean, yes. Because they were just the ultimate team. I, play, I played against that team. <laughs> I, I came into my rookie year against those motherfuckers. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were tough to play against. They were, they had a, a physical cockiness, swagger. We know we're just going to beat you and grind you down. You didn't know who was going to score 30 for them. You didn't know who to, Pen your scouting report around. Rip Hamilton would run off 55 screens. Billups could get off the pick and roll. You know, Ben Wallace would get him 15 extra possessions. Rashid Wallace would be knocking down threes and talking shit to you. Tayshawn Prince, intangible. Like, they were phenomenal. And then their bench too, you know, Delfino at that point. McDice, Max, Maxiel came in a little bit later. Um, I think Arroyo was there for a bit. Like they, they were tough, man. And I think looking at this, I think it's, it's more a compliment than not. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, I love that team. You know, that team was just a hard, hard hitting team that was tough. Larry Brown, a fucking hell of a coach, you know, and they got Rasheed Wallace, like either I want to say off the buyout, the, the buyout market or something like they, they got him sort of, he was in between teams and he just sort of showed up there. I forgot how. Was that Rasheed? Yeah. I think was Yeah. Rasheed Wallace. Yeah. He went to Atlanta, Atlanta, I think. And then. Was in Atlanta, literally played one game for like forty eight hours, yeah. And I don't know, probably did something silly, but yeah, I think they got him out of there, and then he and then he went to Detroit. Yeah, I don't think he wanted to be there. I forgot. Did 
he didn't come directly from Portland or Atlanta. Maybe Portland or Atlanta, maybe for like Theo Ratliff or something. I forgot. And then he just got bought out there and they got him from there. We tried to get him in, in, when I was in Boston, but it just didn't work out. Um, yeah. And you know what, though, Bogues? Like the other, the other team, the other um, in the, uh, Detroit team, the one with Isaiah, besides Isaiah Thomas, they didn't have a hell of a lot of like all-star type players. Joe Dumars was good, but, you know, Bill Lambert and Mark Aguirre and, you know, like they had Adrian Dan- uh They didn't have Dantley. They had Aguirre, but like, like John Sally, they, they just had a lot of like tough, grimy kind of guys too. Like, but that team was, that's interesting. I just guessed. Usually you have it on the, uh, on the run sheet. You didn't even have it on there. I just guessed. I, yeah, you, you, you look at it. Maybe Chauncey Phillips is the only guy that you would think that, you know, deserves to sort of have, any type of chance to be in on that list, but yeah, that's a, that's an interesting, that's definitely a useful stat. That's, that's pretty cool. And he was traded actually. He was traded again, uh, 48 hours later in a, I want to say in a swim, we go to the Hawks along with Mike James, um, Detroit sent, yeah, sent guards, Chucky Atkins and Lindsay Hunter in a first round pick to Boston and guard Bob Sura, uh, Jelko Riracha and a first round pick to Atlanta. Boston also sent forward Chris Mills to Atlanta to complete the deal. So that's how she had ended up in Detroit. So it wasn't a buyout. I picked up Chuck Yakins from the airport. We did trade for him. You're right. I picked him up at the fucking airport. So, uh, yeah, I'm (laughs) multi-talented. You can drive a car. (laughs) Yeah, I can drive a car. So useful? I'm going useful on that one. Thousand percent. Put my stamp on it. Definitely useful. All right. Now this one, don't ask me how they got these numbers, bro, but there's some formula, some you know, mathematician came up with, but the highest win probability in clutch situations this season. Jokic is at number five, 2.0. Monk, 2.1. Kuzma, 2.2. Steph, 2.3. Who do you think number one is? You've got in front of you. Mm. Clutch situations. Steph, number two, you would say. Uh... Number one clutch in clutch situations this season. And I'll give you a tip. He's double Steph's number in clutch situations according to this, this algorithm of however they figured it out. Don't ask me how. Chris Paul? No, DeMar DeRozan. No shit. Good for him. 4.9. Steph's 2.3 in seconds. So I guess however they formulate it, I'm not sure, but it just tells you he's – and he had that he had that streak in about a week where he hit – I think he had a go-ahead game tire and then he had two buzzer beaters in a row. So um, he's having a phenomenal year. Like, could I give a shout-out to him? I mean, he's – I think I read another stat that could be useful, useless, but I think he's averaging – over what is it? Over thirty points the last eight or nine games with only one one three made, <laughs> which is unheard of in this era. Like, but he's he's up there in MVP voting too, in my opinion. I think he's I think he's in the top three now. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know what? I, I saw a tweet by Eddie Johnson who played in the NBA before. He does the Phoenix Suns games, and he and he said that like for as great as Steph is, you would probably tr- like if you're working with a young kid high school kid or whatever, you would want them to play more like DeMar DeRozan than like Steph Curry because Steph just takes so many unbelievable shots because he's an anomaly. He's, he's a, in a, like just a, he's a fairy tale. It, it just, he doesn't, you know, it's, he, it's not true. Like he, he's just ridiculously good. He's an enigma. With DeMar he's, DeRozan. He's an enigma. It's a once it's an in enigma. a, there you once go. in a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. With DeMar DeRozan, like all mid range, you know, face up, step back, face up, drive. You know, pull up from you know, and, and not that Steph doesn't do that, but most of a lot of Steph shots are fucking tough ass circus shots that you know that the globe trotters would take. It's ridiculous, and he's unbelievable at it. And he does make he made a lot of sense with that. I I I, I retweeted it. I thought that yeah, it is true. Like DeRozan, because he as as many shots in the mid range as Steph takes, DeRozan obviously is the king in the mid range. And I would want my players to play a little bit like him. He takes some tough ones. But he's a he is a motherfucker when it comes to just getting that ball in the mid range, pulling up over you, posting up. He's a he's a hell of a player. Fun to watch. Really fun. Yeah, and I think I think if you who would you want your kid to be? You'd pick Steph over DeRozan. But if if you had a, a coaching nuance about which one is more achievable to be, Demar Derozan, no doubt. Yeah, and that goes back to that's not a knock on Steph. That's just he's just he's a once in a lifetime. You see Giannis's comments. I saw that on a clip at the All-Star game online, just giving Steph shit, saying, Steph, you ruined the game, man. You ruined the game, laughing about it. And 
you know, I wouldn't say ruined the game, but he, he hasn't helped the cause of, of these young 13-year-olds pulling up over, <laughs> over half-court in high school games. It's unbelievable. And I'll tell you what, though, Bogues, one thing he did do, though, you know, him and James Harden, more him than Harden, but, like, like these kids could not make them regularly, but, like, it's unbelievable. Like, you can go to, like, a JV boys or girls game in high school, and these kids pull up, and some of them make that shit and like, like, three feet behind the line. I'll tell you what, Mark Cuban, I'll give him a lot of credit to this. When I was, when I was in Dallas, like going second or third year, he goes, pro, I want your, I want our guys shooting in our workouts preseason. I want them shooting two feet behind the line. And I was like, Mark, why the fuck would you want them doing that? Like percentage wise, wouldn't you want them shooting, you know, right at the line? He goes, no, two feet behind the line. And this is when Steph was obviously very good, but like not to the level, not to that big time level he got to. And I was like, Mark, it just doesn't make any sense. But okay, obviously I'll do it. But yeah, and now everybody shoots fucking three feet behind the line. It's crazy. It's insane. Yep, sure is. Yeah, it's 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 a tough shot to make though, and he's making them contested too with double teams. So I got useful. On useful that one. stat. Useful stat. Except Monk being number th- four. Who the fuck would ever thought that he'd shoot? He'd make shots in clutch situations this year. Well, he's yeah, he's made most of their clutch ones. Him and um, yeah. him and Reeves. <laughs> All eleven, all eleven of the Laker wins. He had, yeah, yeah. he had, he had to do it for them. But no, that's that's a useful stat. Useful. useful. All, right. all right, next one. James Harden has now had twenty five points and twelve assists at a minimum in each of his last three debut, debuts. The ki- the kicker of this is nobody nobody in NBA history has ever done that once. Useful, useless. I'll go first. I'm going to say it's useless because. Half the people haven't had a chance to break that record because they haven't fucking changed teams three times. <laughs> Nobody in NBA history has ever done that once. Well, yeah, of course. Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you meant that nobody in debut has ever did 25 and 12. But Last nobody's three. done that one time. Yeah, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who- ESPN yeah. stats and info, bad one. It, I, I read it and I was like, his last three debuts, he's had no less than 25 and 12. I'm like, yeah, that alienates half the field because what if you're a one club player like Larry Bird or you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like that rules you out from even having a chance to break that record. It's not a, it's not necessarily a good thing that he keeps changing teams, right? <laughs> like, no doubt, no doubt. So I'm going useless on that one. Thousand percent useless. You're right, absolutely. All right, last one. Your Celtics pro. Oh, nice. Best defense since December one. Best point differential in 2022. 12 and 2 in their last 14. Only team in the East with a winning record versus 500 teams. Useful or useless? I think it's useful. And I'll tell you why. They're playing great fucking basketball right now. I mean, just like they're, I, I, I didn't like them at all two weeks ago, three weeks ago, what have you. But now the one, the, the flip side to it, I think they're playing very well. They're go- and, and the most important thing is they're defending. You know, their, their offense obviously comes from Brown and, and Tatum, but they're defending and they are playing well and they're and they're flipping a switch and they're playing very, very well. Now, I'm just going on the data that you gave me. So I don't it's not saying that they're, you know, they're the first team, you know, since nineteen seventy three to be doing this or anything. It's just it basically in this year in a nutshell. Right now, in the last month or so, maybe there's only one on the last few weeks, I would say, record wise and just how they're playing. There's not many teams that could fuck with them. Now, the flip side to that is a lot of the teams that they've been facing, like they faced Brooklyn twice, which, you know, they, I mean, they, they have their top three players out. They beat Detroit on the road today. Like they're not beating a lot of great teams with this. So that's the only thing I would say that brings this luster down a little bit. But I'd say it's useful. They are playing great basketball, and I will give them credit for that. Yeah, I agree. Um, useful. I think they've, They've come a long way. We gave them a lot of shit in the first couple of months, and rightfully so. They were horrible, horrible. Um, they've finally turned it around and, and are roughly where we thought they would be, um, but it, probably even better. The last, the last month or two has been phenomenal, so they've made a massive jump, and let's see what they can push in the playoffs. On to you, Pro. No doubt. Folks, fact or fake news. Uh, recently, Charles Oakley was on a podcast, and shocker that – he was making a correlation between old school basketball and today's basketball. And he said that Charles Oakley was a uh, fact or fake news. 
Charles Oakley is correct in saying on a podcast recently that Giannis would come off the bench in his era. Oh, fake news, man. That's just so bad. That's so bad. I think Charles Oakley would come off the bench in today's era, but that's another story. But uh, uh, Giannis, I, like, tell me, give me, name me five. He's borderline seven foot, right? Six eleven. Name me five, six eleven guys that would go coast to coast by crossing someone up. Back in that day, yeah, yeah. I- what Sean Kemp, maybe. And that was straight. That was more straight line. Like I'm just going to run past you. He's not crossing you over and doing all that. So, in the '90s and 2000s, who was doing that coast to coast? Nobody. Very, very rare. I mean, Larry Bird, maybe, but he, the athleticism that Giannis has, the prowess, um, he would have been the number one. He's one of the best athletes today, which would have made him, you know, not even close. He would have been one, two, th- one, two, three, all the way through to fifty best athletes in the league at that point, right? Um, absolutely bonkers to say that. I hate, I hate guys that, you know, the, the, the new, the new school is always going to be better than the old school. That's just the reality, right? Um, as far as the game goes. Now, now, if you want to talk about specific skill, um, shooting technique, may, maybe maybe have a debate there um, with the intangibles of skill sets and whatnot because guys can focus much more about athleticism. But the game itself, it's going to continue to get better. In, in 20 years' time, those players are going to be better than when I played. That's just the way it goes. So just, just nonsense, fake news, hate it. Here's what I would say to that. I would say that physically, as a rookie, he wouldn't have got the minutes that he would have got now. Now that I agree with. Now, if he, yes, like, like, look, Kevin Garnett didn't start until like year two. You know, Kobe didn't start till year two. But I would say that, like, if and now again, I don't know. It's in context. I don't know which Giannis he's talking about. Today's Giannis, fuck no. You know, like he's Dominique Wilkins on steroids. Like that's what he is, and. You know, he, he's a great play. He'd be a great player right now. He'd be a great player back then without question. Would he be the best player in the league? Probably not, but he'd be a great player. As a rookie, he probably physically wouldn't be able to play in that league you know, because of how it was officiated and just what you can get away with, I would say, until year two or three. But once he got there physically, he would have no doubt have been a star, an all-star, and a great player in that era without question. I will say fake news. You know, for sure, because come on, especially if you're talking about him today, I would say. But which player, sure. which play in that era came in their rookie year and, and absolutely dominated with the physicality? None. Like, like most had to adjust. MJ had to adjust, like getting the shit kicked out of him by Detroit. I mean, he still put up big numbers, but what I'm saying is it was much more physical, but a lot of guys had massive ad- adjustment um, time frames to get from college or wherever they came from to yeah. a year or two because it was brutal. Like you could literally clothesline guys and get like a personal foul. <laughs> like like Shaq, yeah, David Robinson comes to mind. Shaq comes to mind. Not Hakeem, many rookies maybe. came in the league. Patrick Ewing, yeah. yeah. And generally bigs, big physical guys, right? Yeah, Giannis, Giannis struggled his first couple of years in the NBA right now, but he, he definitely hadn't grown into his body and was, was skinny as a rake. And, but yeah, that's just nonsense talk. And Oakley, if you're listening to this, don't beat us up, please. Yeah, fuck you. He's not going to beat you up. He's closer to me. So what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be fucking in the middle here. Anyways, part two. Jalen Brunson will win most improved player this year. Fact or fake news? Oh, wow. Who are the other candidates? You got some candidates for me? Yeah, I'll give you some candidates. Hold on, folks. I'll give you um, Miles Bridges. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jean Morant. Here's the thing about Jean Morant. I would never give him the... Like, he's too good. Like, he was, a, he was good last year. Yeah, nah. I don't he's out of the MIP. Come on now. But no, no. so here's, here's what they had. They had Jean Morant, Miles Bridges... Oh, yeah, Miles Bridges is a good one. DeJounte Murray, Darius Garland, uh, Simons, and that's it. Those, those are the other five I'll give you. And that's a betting site, right? Well, who do they have as the favorite? Jean Morant right now is the favorite. Brunson's nowhere to be seen on this site. Ooh, but Yeah, I, mm, I, putting Morant aside, because like, I don't think he should be in the running because he's a, a star anyway. I think fake news. I think I think Dejounte Murray. I'd put above. Um, I, th- I think that's a really good class, by the way. That's going to be a tough tough vote for all those guys, in my opinion. But I think Dejounte Murray's taken a massive jump this season. I think Brunson's been very very good, but I think Murray's Murray's leap has been has been more immense. 
Yeah, I'm going to... You're a Mavs crony. Of course you're going to say fucking... No, 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 fact. no. I'm going to say I'm going to say fake news to that. And I will say Miles Bridges. Okay. Because Miles Bri- Look, Brunson has been great for them. Going to make, you know, 20, 18 to 20 million in free agency without question, in my opinion. He'd be... He's probably going to be the number one player in free agency that you could actually get, not via trade, um, that you could actually sign and, and, and will be available. So he's going to make huge, massive jump in his money. Huge, like he's made a huge jump in his game from this year to the last, last year, last year, this year. But I think Miles Bridges to me, Murray, so here's the thing. Murray, in my opinion, was their best player last year. Like, you know, he was their best player coming into this season. And so he had expectations, maybe not being an all-star, but he had expectations of being a really good player. Miles Bridges was just this, like, hard-playing, role-player, good, like, you know, straight-line driver. And now he's averaging 19 and 7. I think maybe I'd give it to Miles Bridges. So that's my opinion. I'll say fake news to that. I really like Brunson's game. I think he's really good. Um, not a Mavs crony, by the way, but you know, close to it. Here's some numbers for close listeners. To. So, Miles Bridges last season, actually, let's go back even three seasons ago, he averaged 13. Last season, 12.7. This season, 19.9. Um, his rebounds have gone up a little bit. Every category has basically gone up this season. So, he's, he's at basically 20 points, seven rebounds um, a night, um, as opposed to last season was 12 and six. So, that's the comparables there. DeJounte Murray. Uh, you go last season, he was 15, seven rebounds, five assists. He's now at 20, nine and a half assists, eight and a half rebounds. He's almost at a triple double, bro, um, this season. So that's that. And then we'll go Brunson last season, 12 and a half points a night with a handful of assists. Um, this season, 16 and five assists. So they're, they're all pretty similar, I, I guess. Um, I mean, Bridges has taken a seven-point scoring leap. Um, Murray's taken a four-point scoring leap, but has jumped in four in assists and one and a half in rebounds. And Brunson's jumped under four points. So you're probably right. Looking at the numbers, the biggest jump has been Bridges, but I think Murray almost having a triple-double um, might get him over the line. So let's have a little wager and we'll see what happens. No doubt about it. And by the way, can we, can we free Jock Londale, by the way? I mean, what the can fuck, we free Pop? Chuck Pop, come on. Give our guys uh, some minutes. Can we, buy, can, can we buy him a bottle of wine or something and put this fucking guy in and multi, like, like multiple games in a row? He does have 10 points tonight, though. He's playing on a back. Uh, Collins. Yeah, Collins is probably Collins out. Is playing. Oh, he is? No, he's playing. Ooh. Yeah, he's playing. Yeah, Londale. Pop 13, curveball. Uh, right now, 14 minutes he's played. It's end of the th- almost the end of the third. Four out of six, 10 points. Three, uh, three for three from the line, one for three from the three, two rebounds. Uh, I'm sorry, one rebound, two assists. That's what so, I'm trying to figure out. Right? Uh, you just don't know if they're tanking or what the hell they're doing because like, he'll, he'll play phenomenally, um, be vital in a win for him and then not play for three nights and then get garbage time and then not play. So hashtag free Jock Landau pop. Come on, man. Comb your hair a bit more tighter and get him in the game. Yeah, let's, let's free this motherfucker, would he? How about that? I go from he shouldn't be making the national team to fucking, you know, <laughs> I put my career on the line trying to get him. So, you know, yeah, let's do that. So is that, that all I got for you, folks? Is no, that three? you got a number three. Oh, my fault, my fault, my fault. Mm. Don't edit this out, uh, big guy. What, what's, uh, Keep the shenanigans on you. Yeah, yeah, because I fucked up. I, I'll, I'll own my fuck up. I'm not, De- I'm not De'Aaron Fox. <laughs> all right. The NBA dunk contest will still exist in 2026. Oh, I I hope that uh, fact uh, what wait, will exist. I hope it's fake news. I think it's I think it's pretty much done. I think robots might be involved at that point. Um, but will it still exist? I think fact it will still exist, much to the despise of you and I. So I'll go fact on that one. I'm gonna say fake news, but I know something like they're gonna like up it. They're gonna you know they'll do something. You know I don't know what the fuck they're gonna do, but. They'll do something, but I'm going to say fact. It will not. I'm sorry. uh, It will still exist. So fake news. I say it does not exist by 2026. They'll they'll move on to something else. Yeah, it's 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 done the testament of time. You know, it hasn't hasn't done the testament of time. Like it's 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 starting to get 
mundane. Like I said, interesting to see what they do to fix it. Don't think there's an easy fix. Um, maybe they can go to a finger roll contest or a running hook contest or something. Change it up a little That'd bit. Be great. That'd be great. <laughs> All right, cool. That wraps up episode 55. Thanks, everybody. Reminder, if you ever want to jump on live with us via the call-in app, download the call-in app. I believe it's available for Android and iPhone. I think they're doing a platform on websites. It's very, very easy. You can jump on, ask a question, and you might even – Get on the podcast that we um, that we release. So jump on there and ask some questions. Usually some good conversations there. Check out Pro for some basketball advice. He does a lot of um, film editing and cutting and advice and all that kind of stuff. So um, whether you're a high school coach or whatever, he can give you some good advice at Hoop Consultants. And then our socials are at Rogue Bogues and we're on all your favorite social media channels. So check us out. Thanks for joining us. And if anybody's got a girlfriend that has an in with a front office, <laughs> call me. I need a fucking job. <laughs> We'll work on it. Maybe you can call you can call our Hawks next season, bro. In off season, they might be hiring. How about me and Scott Roth on the same staff? I just want to pay. I'd pay him to, to scream, just for like scream, because the guy's like a wrestler out of the nineties. It's fucking great. Yeah, you two would be a great that tag guy. team. Yeah, no doubt. Adios. All right, adios.